Welcome back to chapter 16. In this section, we will cover off the end of chapter 16 and talk about hybrid financial instruments and accounting for stock options. So our second learning objective in chapter 16 requires us to analyze and account for hybrid compound instruments from an issuer perspective. What are hybrid compound instruments? Well, hybrid compound instruments are a combination of debt and equity in a single instrument. This was created so capital markets could profit from best attributes of both debt and equity. They may have dual attributes of both. For instance, preferred shares may be convertible um, into debt or debt convertible into preferred shares. For example, preferred shares, they're not quite common shares. They're higher than common shares. They rank higher in preference. They pay regular dividends, so they do have some similarities to debt. Uh, other examples of hybrid compound instruments include convertible debt, which we'll take a good look at, term preferred shares, and mandatorily redeemable shares. The main issue for hybrid compound instruments is presentation. Should the instrument be presented as debt or equity? In making this assessment, we need to consider the following. The contractual terms, is there an obligation to pay cash? Does the holder have the choice to receive cash and what are the settlement options? The economic substance of the transaction, are there any equity-like features? And we need to remember the definitions of the financial liability and equity. Remember a financial liability for both IFRS and SB is a contractual obligation to deliver cash or another financial asset to a party or to exchange financial instruments under conditions that are potentially unfavorable. IFRS explicitly includes instruments settled using a variable number of shares as financial liabilities. And this is also supported generally by ASPE. Remember the definition of equity in both IFRS and ASPE is that equity is any contract that represents a residual interest in the, in the assets after deducting liabilities. And IFRS provides additional guidance where instruments are settled through their own shares. We also need to think about if financial instruments can be offset on our statement of financial position. If the company has a legally enforceable right to net an asset and a liability, then perhaps the two can be presented net or if the company intends to settle on a net basis or at the exact same time, then there may be some argument to net an asset and liability. So how do we measure hybrid compound instruments? Well, financial instruments are measured at fair value. There are two approaches to allocating the value to components. So when we have a joint instrument, we need to figure out how we're going to allocate the two pieces. So if it's debt and equity together, how do you know what part of it goes into equity? How do you know what part of it goes into the debt section of our statement of financial position? So there's two values and you've heard about these before, or two ways of doing this. So there's a residual value approach, which is an incremental method, where you know the value of one thing, so you deduce the value of the other or there's the relative fair value or the proportional method approach. IFRS requires the residual value approach and it wants the debt to be valued first. And IFRS, or sorry, ASPE allows the equity component to be valued at zero or the residual method. So it can also allow the easier method to be, or easier component to be measured first, or you can even make an election under ASPE just to say, listen, I know that there's an equity component of this, but I'm going to measure the equity at zero and I'll just value the debt. Subsequent to that initial valuation, the debt will be measured at amortized cost. And whatever classification method is chosen at inception has to continue until the asset is de-recognized. The most common hybrid financial instrument is convertible debt. So a convertible bond is a bond that may be converted into common shares of the company or possibly preferred shares. It combines the benefits of a bond with the privilege of exchanging it for common shares at the holder's option. 
Convertible debt is often purchased by investors who want the security of a bond holding, a guaranteed interest, plus the added option of conversion if the value of the common shares increases significantly. Companies may issue convertible debt in order to not give up more equity control than is necessary and also obtain cheaper debt financing because it gives the investors a significant upside. There are reporting issues in the accounting for convertible debt at all of the following times. So we need to know how to record it at issuance, how to record it at conversion, and how to record it at retirement. So let's talk about issuance. So compound instruments must be split into their components and presented separately in the, state, in the financial statements. Since the embedded option to convert the common shares is an equity instrument, that part of the instrument will be presented as equity. The remaining component will be presented as liability. And remember that ASPE allows an accounting policy choice to measure the equity portion at zero. So let's take a look at an example. Bond Corp offers three-year 6% convertible bonds with a par of $1,000. Each 1,000 bond may be converted into 250 common shares, which are currently trading at $3 per share. Similar straight bonds carry an interest rate of 9%. 1,000 bonds were, are issued at par. So the company records under IFRS, so they have to use the residual value approach and they have to measure the debt first. That's what IFRS requires. So let's take a look at, um, let's take a look at how we would calculate that. So the interesting thing about this is that we need to value the debt. And hopefully we remember chapter 14 because we are going to need to whip out our financial calculators and measure this debt from the information that's provided. Okay, so get out mine. Okay, so what do we know here? So we're told that it's a three, the bond is a three year. So our N is going to be three. Three year, uh, 6%. So it's a 6% bond. So our payment is gonna be 6% times the principal. We've got each $1,000 bond. So it's a $1,000 par bond and there's a thousand of them. So a thousand times a thousand. So we're gonna get a million. Million times 6% is gonna be our payment. So we're gonna have a $60,000 payment we're gonna have a future value of a million, which is what we need to pay back the bond for. And what is our I gonna be? That's a great question. So it says that it's a 6% bond, but make sure that you're looking at that last sentence of the question where it says similar straight bonds carry an interest rate of 9%. We need to use the market rate as the I, so we're gonna use that 9%. So if you put in N3, I9, present value, or sorry, future value a million and payment of 60,000, and then compute present value, we should get to this uh, 900,000, So that's gonna be the value of the debt. And we know that the amount that was actually paid for this instrument was a million dollars. So therefore the value, so a million dollars less that value that we calculated for the bond is gonna give us the incremental value of the option. So $75,939 is going to be the value that we're gonna to allocate to the equity option. So the journal entry for IFRS is going to be debit cash, a million dollars, credit, debit bonds payable, that amount that we calculated is the present value. We know we always put bonds on our statement of financial position at the present value of the cash flows. So 924,061. And then credit contributed surplus with it noted that it's for conversion rates. And that's gonna be the difference between the million that we paid and the present value of the bond that we calculated. 
So of course we know that contributed surplus is part of our equity section on our statement of financial position and we're specifically labeling it as conversion rights so we can remember to look back for that later. So you could record the same entry under ASPI uh, or ASPI could also decide to value the equity, section, equity um, component of this instrument at zero. So therefore it could just record the entire bond payable at a million dollars. And that is an accounting policy choice that is permitted under ASPI, not permitted under IFRS. IFRS requires us to value the bond or the debt first and then value and then allocate the residual value to the equity component. Okay, so now what happens when this debt is converted? So if the bonds are converted into other securities, the main accounting issue is to determine the amount at which to record the securities that have been exchanged for the bond. So here's an example. The holders decided to convert their bonds before the bonds matured. The bond discount will be partially amortized at this point. Assume that the unamortized portion is 14,058. Okay, so the bond is only partially amortized. So we are going to need to, let's see. So we need to clear out the contributed surplus. You know that there's our 75,939 because we exercise the option. The, val the book value of the bond would be a million dollars minus the 14,058 because we're told that there is 14,058 that's not amortized. So we're just deducing what the value of the bond is on our statement of financial position through that simple math. So that means the bond must be on our statement of financial position at 985,942. So we're gonna remove that then because we don't want the bond on our statement of financial position anymore because this bond is being exercised. And we're putting the value of both of those two things into common shares because we've just converted the debt piece of that into 100% equity. And this is called the book value method. What is the book value method? So the book value method is the method of recording bond conversion and it's required under IFRS and ASPI, assuming that you're not um, valuing the equity at zero under ASPI. So support for the book value approach is based on the argument that an agreement was established at the date when the bond was issued, either to pay a stated amount of cash at maturity or issue a stated number of shares. Therefore, when the bond is converted to equity, no gain or loss is recorded on the conversion of the bond and any accrued interest that was forfeited would be treated as part of the new book value of the shares. So if we go back, you can see that there's no gain or loss on settlement of debt. All that happened is we just cleared out whatever we had in our statement of financial position and it all went into the book value of the common shares. That's what the book value method is. Now the book value method works well when you're converting debt, but when you're inducing conversion, um, it's a little bit different. So sometimes the issuer wants to induce or cause a prompt conversion of its convertible debt to equity securities in order to reduce interest costs or improve debt to equity. So they may offer some sort of a sweetener such as cash. So they might say, listen, if you, in, if you exercise our option now, we'll give you extra shares or we'll give you extra cash. Um, and so they're trying to entice the person to, to actually exercise the option right then. So there is a difference in the accounting between IFRS and ASPI. So ASPI requires the additional premium to be allocated between the debt and equity component, consistent with however it was originally done, if it was incremental or residual value, and under IFRS, the whole amount will be recognized as a loss. So we just said that the book value method doesn't create a gain or loss on the settlement of debt, but if there's an induced conversion, then all bets are off. So here's an example. What if the company offers an additional cash premium of $15,000 to the bondholders to convert at a time when the carrying amount of the debt 
is 972,476. The fair value of the bonds at this time was 981,462. Okay, so how are we gonna record induced conversion under IFRS? Well, <laughs> they agreed to give us an extra 15,000 in cash. So we're going to have to clear out the bonds payable. We know that. So it says the carrying amount of the debt is 972,476. So we're debiting bonds payable to get that liability off of our statement of financial position. We are going to have, we're gonna clear out the contributed surplus of that 75,939,000 because the, ex, the option is being exercised. And then we're gonna calculate the value of the shares, which is the amount, the, the carrying amount of the bonds plus the option. So the 972 plus the 75,000 in contributed surplus is gonna give us the value of the common shares at $1,048,415. And then you can see that we recorded the cash of 15,000, but we've recorded a loss on the bonds. So we've actually said debit loss on bonds and credit cash. Because even though they paid us this additional cash premium to convert, it didn't, it really just took away from the amount that we were going to receive through the bonds. What if the bond fair value is 981,462 and we need to record this journal entry under ASPE? So ASPE is going to say, okay, well, you got a $15,000 inducement and we need to figure out how we're going to allocate this between the bond and the equity component. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, well, the carrying amount of the bond or the fair value of the bond there in the question is 981,462 less the carrying amount of the bond, which we were told earlier was 972,476. Then we are gonna have a shortage of $8,986. So that amount is going to need to be allocated to the bond, loss on the bond. And then the 15,000 minus the 8,986 is going to be allocated to the equity. So to record, so then now we know the split. So we figured out the ratio of how we're gonna split that $15,000 that we paid out to exercise that option, to have the person exercise that option and how we're gonna split that between the debt and the equity component. So now we are simply going to record the entry. So we're going to clear out the bond payable. We've got the, the carrying value of the bond there. We're going to have the loss on the bonds, which was that $8,968 that we calculated above. We've got contributed surplus. We're clearing that out. We The remaining allocation to equity of the 6014 we are going to clear out through retained earnings. And we are going to credit common shares for the 1,048,415. And then we're going to credit cash for the 15,000 for that mountain paid out as the sweetener. So you can see that ASPE is actually more complicated in this instance um, because it requires that pro rata split of the sweetener between the debt and the equity components. Okay, so, <clears throat> so, okay, we've got, we already went through these entries. Okay, so convertible debt at regular retirement. So at retirement of the liability component of convertible debt, we need to figure out how we're going to measure it. So the equity component will remain in contributed surplus. Bonds payable, the unamortized premium or discount are zeroed out. And the law, gain or loss is allocated between the debt and the equity portion using the original method. Once classification is decided, the original, the related interest dividends, gains and losses must be consistently treated. 
So here's an example. B Corp decides to retire the convertible debt early. They offer bondholders a million seventy thousand of cash. The fair value of the bond is without the option is nine hundred thousand nine hundred eighty one thousand four hundred sixty two dollars, and the carrying value is nine hundred seventy two thousand four hundred seventy six dollars. So the journal entry for early retirement, we need to clear out the bonds payable. We need to clear out contributed surplus. And we need to clear out, and we need to record that cash payment. So then we are going to have the difference between the bond fair value and the carrying value of the bonds. It's going to be a loss on the redemption of the bonds. And the remaining difference of the equity portion is going to be recorded through retained earnings. So as we said on the previous slide, interest dividends, gains, and losses has to follow the same classification that we've recorded the underlying instruments. For instance, dividends are normally debited to retained earnings, but if the economic substance of a term preferred share is debt, the dividends on term preferred shares will be treated as interest or dividends expense. All right, let's take a look at learning objective number three our last learning objective for chapter 16. Describe an account for share-based compensation and identify the major differences in accounting between IFRS and ASPE and what changes are expected in the near future. Stock-based compensation plans can be used as a long-term approach to remunerate or compensate employees for services provided. They can also help companies conserve cash because no cash is paid up front when these options are granted. There are accounting issues related to the recognition and measurement of share-based compensation plans. Stock compensation can include direct awards of stock. It can include a compensatory comp stock option plan. It can include share appreciation rights or performance type plans. The last two of those share appreciation rights and performance type plans are more complex than we're gonna cover in this chapter, but you're welcome to take a look at those in appendix, in the appendices for chapter 16. Okay, employee stock option plans or ESOPs. These give employees a chance for ownership in the company. The issue is often made to a wide group of people and it's meant to motivate employees and raise capital. The underlying transactions here will be treated as capital transactions. Compensatory, compensatory stock option plans or CSOPs are part of remunerating management and employees for service. And they're treated as operating transactions because they're seen as related to salaries expense. You can also have share-based compensation plans that are related to acquisitions of companies where perhaps you're gonna acquire a company and issue shares in exchange. Uh, th those are also options. So here's a quick comparison of employee stock option plans and compensation stock option plans. So compensation stock option plans are meant to compensate employees. They're paid for service. The amount's going to be expensed through salaries expense through the operating. It's an operating transaction. It's going to go through the income statement. And employee stock option plans, they're the employee will usually pay for the options, so they're not part of their compensation. They could be part of their overall compensation, but not direct. The employee is going to invest in the company. It's going to be charged to equity accounts, and it's seen as a capital transaction that will go through shareholders' equity. Just a reminder here of why employee stock option plans or uh, senior management stock option plans are treated differently from an accounting perspective than the other options that we talked about earlier in chapter 16. And it's what, really it come, what it really comes down to is whether they're exchange traded. So when we were looking at options related to uh, purchasing, you know, grain in the future or what have you, then that, if those options are exchange traded, then they need to be marked to market through the income statement. Whereas, the plans that we're talking about now or the options that we're talking about now, there's still options that are related to employee stock option plans or 
uh, compensation stock option plans for senior management, because those are not traded on an exchange and you generally have to be an employee in order to participate in them, the accounting is different. So let's talk about employee stock option plans. So when an option or share right is sold to an employee, cash will be debited and contributed surplus will be credited for the amount of the premium. When the right or option is exercised, the cash account is again debited for the exercise price, along with the contributed surplus to clear it out, and the common share account will be credited to record the issuance of the shares. Any premium paid for unexercised options will remain in contributed surplus. So employee stock option recognition, a company set up an employee stock option that gives employees the option to purchase company shares for $10 each. The option premium is $1 and there are 10,000 shares available. On January 1st, employees purchased 6,000 options. Subsequently, all options were exercised and 6,000 shares were issued. So to record the employee purchase of options, it's gonna be 6,000 shares times the $1 premium. So the company is gonna record debit cash, credit contributed surplus stock options. And when the options are exercised, they're gonna record debit cash, 60,000, because now they have 6,000 times 10 options or 6,000 uh, shares times $10. They're gonna clear out the contributed surplus stock options and they're going to record 66,000 through common shares to reflect the additional equity that was issued now to the employees. Compensation stock options. So even though compensation stock option plans do not usually involve the transfer of cash when the options are first granted, they're still recognized in the financial statements and measured at fair value. The transaction has economic value since many employees accept the stock options in lieu of a salary or bonus. Recall that an option gets its value from two components, the intrinsic value and a time component. While the intrinsic value may be easy to measure, may be easy to measure the shares fair value less the exercise price, the time value component is more difficult. The compensation cost that arises from employee stock options or compensation stock options should be recognized as the services provided. The total compensation expense is calculated on the date when the options are granted to the employee and is based on the fair value of the options that are expected to vest. The grant date is when the employee and the company agree on the value of what is to be exchanged. And this is therefore the measurement date. Okay, so in terms of valuing the compensation stock options, uh, it's going to need to use an option pricing model, which is going to include various inputs, the exercise price, the expected life, the current market value of the underlying stock, the stock volatility, the expected dividends, and the risk-free rate of interest. So if we take a look at the compensation expense, it's going to be recognized in the periods in which the employee performs the service, which is going to be the vesting period between the grant date and the vesting date. Thus the total compensation cost is determined at the grant date and allocated to the periods that benefit from the employee's service. So you can see in this chart here, we've got the grant date when the options are granted. We've got some sort of a vesting date. Usually they're not exercisable immediately. And then you've got your exercise dates, which could be a period of time. And then at some point, the option is going to expire. So when we recognize the expense related to the option through the income statement, we're going to need it to benefit all the periods that the employee could benefit from that option. Here's an example. On November 1st, 2020, the shareholders of Chen Corp approve a plan that grants options to the company's five executives to purchase 2,000 of the company's common shares each. The options are granted on January 1st, 2021 and may be exercised at any time after December 31st, 2022. The exercise price per share is $60. 
To keep this simple, we'll assume that the fair value through the option pricing model resulted in a compensation expense of $220,000. Assume that the documents that are associated with the issuance of the options indicate that the expected period of benefit or service is two years, starting on the grant date. Prepare the journal entries related to this plan for 2021 and 2022. So January 2021, there's no journal entry because the service period has not started. The service period is going to be starting on the grant date. So the grant date is... January 1st, 2021, and it's gonna be over two years. So that's just the beginning of it. So there's not gonna be anything to record on day one. December 31st, 2022. So there's been one year out of two years now that the, um, that the senior management has held on to these compensation stock options. So they're gonna recognize half of the $220,000 compensation expense that was generated by the option pricing model, which is 110,000. So they're gonna, the journal entry is gonna be debit compensation expense through the income statement and credit contributed surplus stock options. It doesn't mean that they've exercised anything yet. This is simply the company accruing the, the fact that these options are out there. And that's what the value of them is expected to be. December, 2022, recognize the expense in the period in which the employee provides the service. So that you're gonna record the same entry for the additional 110, so that over the two years, the entire 220,000 has been recognized. Now assume that 20% or 2,000 of the 10,000 options were exercised on June 1st, 2024. So to record the exercise of the options, we're gonna have 120,000 in cash, which is simply the 2,000 shares times the $60 exercise price. We're gonna clear out 20% of the amount in contributed surplus because 20% of it was redeemed. We're just gonna simply say, well, whatever we have in contributed surplus, we'll take 20% of that out that's related to stock options, which is 44,000. And we're gonna credit common shares for, 20, for 164,000, the sum of the two, to recognize the equity value that's now been issued to the employees who exercise that option. Assume the remaining options were not exercised and expired. So what happens is we leave it in contributed surplus until it expires. When it expires, then we are going to move it into another contributed surplus account. We're simply reclassing it. We had it in an account called stock options. We're just gonna move it into an account called expired stock options. Simply classification within contributed surplus. The fact that a stock option is not exercised does not make it incorrect to record the cost of the services received from executives that have been attributed. So even though many 80% of the options were forfeited, we still didn't change the compensation expense that went through the income statement. However, if a stock option is forfeited because an employee fails to satisfy a requirement, for instance, if they quit the company, then the estimate of compensation expense needs to be adjusted. And the entry would be between reducing the compensation expense and reducing the impact on contributed surplus. ASPE allows a choice where either we can estimate people that are going to leave up front or we can account for them as they occur. I4S says we have to estimate it up front. But either way, there's obviously going to be a difference between our estimate and the actual amount of people, executives that leave. So if there's a significant difference, then we would need to adjust the journal entry. There can also be direct awards of stock. So rather than issuing options, stock can just be issued directly to employees. Um, and this, the direct awards of stock are recognized at fair value. Stock option plans, there needs to be full disclosure made, uh, the accounting policy use, descriptions of the plans and modifications, details of the number and values of options issued, exercise forfeited, forfeited and expired, descriptions of assumptions and methods used to determine fair value through option pricing models, and total compensation costs included in net income and contributed surplus. So quickly, IFRS and ASPE. We've already gone through a couple of differences between IFRS and ASPE throughout uh, the, the course of this chapter. 
And the standards for stock-based compensation are largely similar. Looking ahead, there is a hedge accounting process project that's being undertaken by the IASB to improve hedge accounting requirements or, or clarity around the guidance, I should say. And the board hopes to issue a further discussion paper on micro hedging. That concludes the lecture for chapter 16, part two. Again, please join me for the tutorial section to work through some more questions.